Please help me welcome Lisa C. Thank you. Is this actually on? I feel like it does. I don't think it's on. So it is on. Okay, it's on. All right, so how nice to see all of you. When I heard that this was going to be on a Friday night, I thought not a single person is going to come. And actually, Janet, is Janet here? Where is Janet? Jan Janet sent me an email earlier tonight saying she was coming and bringing a friend. And I said, well, if no one comes, we'll just go get martinis. But I guess the martinis are now out. So it's really nice to see you. And there are people here, f old, old friends, nice to see. And old friends from the Smithsonian who helped with, uh, who were helped with the On Gold Mountain show that we did here several years ago. And then just, you know, like all you nice people it's so nice I can't believe it I'm like you know like oh <laughs> oh okay so you know that I write a lot about women uh, I've written about best friends for life I've written about mothers and daughters I've written about sisters but I've been thinking for a long time about the nature of a friendship of three my mother has been uh, in a group of three since seventh grade she's now 80 so that's now you know almost almost 70 years and and uh, here's this is being taped so we have to hope nobody watches that that I'm gonna mention uh, but, um, <laughs> but my mother Joan and Jackie have been friends all these years and here's what I can tell you that it on any given day one of them is on the outs <laughs> sometimes it lasts a week sometimes a month and in the case of Joan 20 years but they all made up again at their 60th high school reunion, so that was good. But you know, you never know what could happen for the next 20. So I've, I've been thinking about this a lot. And actually, I was just in Portland on book tour, and a man who interviewed me told me that NASA had done a study on sending people into space, and should you send two or should you send three? And their studies showed unequivocally that you should only send two at a time because if you send three if it's men or women or mixed two are always going to gang up on one so this turns out not to just be a woman thing it just <laughs> covers the waterfront so I'd been thinking about this for quite a long while and then when I was out on my last book tour for Dreams of Joy, there was an event. I wish I could remember where it was. I wish I could write to these women today. But there was an event where there was a long line to get the book signed. And I could see this little group of three coming for, for quite a while. And two of them were like, talking, 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 laughing, 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 having the best time. And the other one was over. And she looked so hurt and so dejected and just so, you know, I just felt so sorry for her, except for one other thing, which was she had like steam coming out of her ears because she was so angry. So I thought, well, okay, no matter what, for the next book, I have to write about a group of three friends. So China Dolls is about three friends, three young women who meet at an audition at the Forbidden City nightclub in San Francisco in 1938. This was the era of the nightclub and in San Francisco there were these Chinese American nightclubs uh, in San Francisco Chinatown that specialized in all Chinese entertainment. So these were people who were billed as the Chinese Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, the Chinese Frank Sinatra, the Chinese Houdini, the Chinese, you know, fill in the blank. And so people, and, but actually not all of them were Chinese uh, because you could be Japanese, you could be Filipino, you could even be Portuguese. You know, if you wanted to perform in a nightclub, there weren't many places to go. You either had the white nightclubs or black nightclubs or these Chinese American nightclubs. So um, there were a lot of, it was a lot, big mixture there, but always billed as Chinese American. And when people would go out on tour around the country, they didn't say, oh, we're going out on the Borscht Belt or we're going out on the Chitlin Circuit. They'd say, we're going out on the Chop Suey Circuit. <laughs> so three young women. The first of these is Grace. She has grown up in Plain City, Ohio. She's actually the closest uh, to what these women and men were alike who were became performers. Uh, Grace herself says she's just grown up, you know, a fly speck on the wallpaper of small town life. Uh, her parents have already 
broken the mold, right? They've broken away from Chinatown. They've broken away from tradition, culture, customs. To go out into the middle of the country where they're the only family, Chinese family, for maybe 100 square miles. And to do that, you know, what, what's the purpose of that? It's really to try to become the reddest, the whitest, the bluest. And what would any little girl in that era in the 1930s aspire to be? Shirley Temple now, come on, this is being taped. You've got a show like you're into it, okay? <laughs> All right, so, so Shirley Temple. So she's learned to tap dance and sing and uh, events arise where she runs away at age 17 and goes to San Francisco. The next of these girls is, a young, is Helen and she's the exact opposite of Grace and in fact she truly is just a, a fictional construct because in all of my research I didn't find a single woman who had become a performer who had grown up in a Chinatown. If you had grown up in Chinatown, you know, it's very conservative and, and you have all of that tradition and so young women were not allowed to show their arms and legs in public. They were supposed to stay home and learn to knit, embroider, tat, crochet, cook, take care of children so that they would become good wives and mothers. And so with Helen, I thought, what would it have taken for her family to allow her to dance in a nightclub? What would she have done? What could have possibly have been done to her that they would allow this to happen? Now the other thing about Helen is she lives in a big traditional Chinese compound with a big interior courtyard, much like the compounds I've written about in the other books uh, that take place in China. Uh, with you know living with all of her relatives 30 or more relatives and you might think oh that could never happen in real life they didn't have anything like that in San Francisco but in fact they did and here's how I know a couple of years ago I was invited to the best writing gig of my entire life I went to speak for one hour at Canyon Ranch the you know the really fancy spa and in exchange they allowed me and my husband to stay there for a week and have as many treatments as we wanted. <laughs> I don't know why they don't ask us back every month but they haven't. Okay so one night seated next to me this is just completely random seated next to me was a woman who had grown up in a traditional compound with 30 of her relatives with an interior courtyard right in the heart of Chinatown. If any of you uh, did grow up in San Francisco or know San Francisco, her family was the Fong Fong Bakery, which was known for their famous pineapple cake. Okay, then the next one is Ruby. And Ruby is Japanese masquerading as Chinese. And when she's asked about that, she s answers, as several performers actually told me, she looked on the, but that Ethel Zimmerman looked on the marquee and thought her name looked too long and so she had shortened her name to Ethel Merman and so Ruby Fukutami has now shortened her name to Ruby Tom. But as I said earlier there were other practical reasons to do that. You know if you wanted to work this was the only way to do it. It was to pretend that you were Chinese to get an actual job in a club. But Ruby is different in other ways. She has, in her life, she spent part of her time on Terminal Island in Southern California, a very large Japanese American community, out in Hawaii, another large Japanese American community, in Alameda and San Francisco Bay, another large Japanese community. And what do these three places have also in common? Naval bases. So Ruby loves sailors and sailors completely love her and uh, she is unlike any character I've written before she has this really kind of wacky wonderful way of looking at the world sometimes she would say things and I would just think I don't know where you that came from you know it was just amazing she just doesn't think like anyone I've ever met anyway she um, at one point she uh, just is talking about women in friendship and she says a woman isn't just one thing. The past is in us, constantly changing us. Heartache and failure shift our perspectives, as do joy and triumphs. At any moment, on any given day, we can be friends, competitors, or enemies. We can be generous or stingy, loving or petty, helpful or understanding. So three friends who've all met at the Forbidden City nightclub. Now, when I was doing the research, 
I th there were a lot of times that I could have set this novel. The nightclubs in San Francisco really start around 1938. They end around 1970. So that's a pretty long span. But I decided to focus on from 1938 to 1948, 10 years. It's not a decade with zeros, but it is a transformative decade for our country, uh, for our people, for the West, certainly, for San Francisco, for Chinese Americans, Japanese Americans, for all of us. You have the end of the Depression, World War II, and then the introduction and really adoption of television in a really big way into our homes. And so in just these 10 years, we change how we look at each other, how we look at the outside world, how we dress, what we eat, how we spend time with our families, how we spend our free time. All right, so when you first see Grace, she has uh, just arrived in San Francisco, and she first tries to get a job at the Golden Gate International Exhibition. This was San Francisco's second World's Fair, and they took a very different approach than any other World's Fair up to that point. Instead of just inviting countries from around the world, they only invited countries that dotted the edge of the Pacific Ocean. And this is the very first time that the phrase Pacific Rim is used. And obviously this is something that is, continues to be really important to us today. And in the main part of the exhibition, you had these country pavilions, uh, you know, that had dancing and art and lectures and music and beautiful architecture and fountains. And then over here was another part of the fair called the Gayway. And in the Gayway, it's like everything that was really sophisticated over here was all, you know, pretty vulgar but a lot of fun. A big carnival atmosphere. And you could go and you could s go to the headless woman display, you could go see the sword swallower, you could go to the flea circus, you could, there was a man who would swallow neon tubes and so you could see his innards lit up. There was, you could go to the incubator bar, have a drink, and watch babies grow. Uh, you know, just uh, Sally Rand who had had a big splash in, at the Chicago World's Fair with her fan dancing and bubble dancing, she also opened a place uh, in the Golden Gate exhibition. This is also the very first place in the world where you could see nylon stockings, um, nylon stockings, electric razors, and again, television. So people were c going to be coming from all over the world, from all over the country, either to work in this fair or to visit the fair as tourists. And so San Francisco, like any other big city, you know, if you're like preparing for the Olympics, they went through this whole sprucing up campaign, you know, building new hotels and planting trees. And Chinatown didn't want to be left behind and they launched what was called the Shine for 39 campaign. And really at the heart of that campaign was to erase these old stereotypes about Chinatown, that it was a place of gambling, prostitution, opium, most of that stuff was long gone, but the stereotypes had remained. And interestingly enough, in, in Los Angeles, Chinatown, where I'm from, uh, we went through a very similar project in the same year, 1938. Again, to get rid of these old stereotypes. And so within two weeks in Los Angeles, two new Chinatowns opened. The first was New Chinatown, now called Old Chinatown, and the other one was China City. And so in, in San Francisco, they you know, build all kinds of new things. They open new curio shops, all kinds of new restaurants, bars, and then these nightclubs. And the most famous of the nightclubs was called the Forbidden City. And it actually wasn't in Chinatown. It was a couple of blocks out of so outside of Chinatown. So that made it not just the most famous of the nightclubs, but it's the first Chinese-American nightclub to be outside of a Chinatown. OK, now I'm going to just stop here for a second and talk a little bit about my research. If you've heard me before, you know that that's my absolute favorite part of the whole process. And so, you know, when you're doing a book like this and, you know, I'm going to have the opening of the Forbidden City nightclub, I wanted to find people who may have gone to an audition, who may have worked there, who, what did they wear <coughs> uh, when, when the customers came, what did they wear, what did they eat, what did they drink, what was, a, what was it like a month into the, into the, after the opening, what was it like five years later. 
And so I did meet and interview a woman named Mary Ong Tom. She was 93 when I interviewed her. She's 96 now. When I interviewed her, she was still teaching jazzercise. <laughs> and this was a, she's actually really um, pretty representative of a lot of these performers, again, men or women, very difficult childhood. She had grown up in Tucson when, you know, just on the outskirts of Tucson, actually. Uh, her father died when she was very young. Her mother had bound feet. They had a grocery store, 20 by 20 square feet, 11 brothers and sisters, desperately, desperately poor. And a family friend in San Francisco sent money and said, send Mary out to me. I'll see what I can do for her. And, but Mary was so poor that she would walk everywhere in San Francisco because she couldn't afford the nickel bus fare. Anyway, she did get an audition at the Forbidden City nightclub, and she was one of the original eight chorus girls to be hired there. And she had all kinds of wonderful stories. I also talked to the sons and daughters of many of these performers. I talked to the son of the Chinese Frank Sinatra, uh, the, the daughter of the owner of the Forbidden City. Um, uh, this, the, another woman, Jody Long, who ended up doing the audio version of, of uh, China Dolls. And her parents had a kind of song and dance comedy act. And so these three people especially talked to me a lot from a child's perspective of, of what it was like to be backstage at the Forbidden City, but also other nightclubs because their parents had traveled the Chop Suey circuit. And so what it was like backstage, you know, the little boys zipping up and unzipping the women in their costumes. There was one little boy they all separately told me about who would peek out of the curtain at the back side of, to see the back side of the fan dancer and how he would get in trouble every night, but they couldn't <laughs> keep him away from that curtain. But my favorite of these women was, uh, is named um, Mai Tai Sing. And Mai Tai, she was 88 when I interviewed her. She's 91 now. Now, this is a woman who cut a seriously wide swath. I think she slept with every man in Hollywood and then some. <laughs> and in fact, at my very first book event for China Dolls in Pasadena, uh, there was a man who came through the line, and he kind of leaned in, and he said, I knew Mai Tai. You know, <laughs> and then but then he went on to list all these other people that he knew. You know, says, says, and she slept with this guy, and she had a two-year affair with this actor, and so she cut a seriously wide swath. But she also had had a very very difficult childhood. Uh, her f she was born in Los Angeles. When she was five, the family was so poor that they moved um, back to Hong Kong. She must have been a pretty interesting five-year-old because she kept saying to her father, I love glitter, I love glitter, I need to be in Hollywood. <laughs> and for whatever reason, he borrowed money and sent Mai Tai and her mother back to Los Angeles where they earned a living making paper cups at the kitchen table um, and selling them for two cents a dozen. By the time she was 13, she was supporting her entire family with her dancing. She had brought her entire family back over from Hong Kong. She was just a very interesting woman. And at one point I asked her, so Mai Tai, you know, what was your favorite costume all the years you were dancing? And she said, oh, that's easy. Well, she didn't say it like that. No. OK, so here's the thing. These are really little people. I mean, really tiny, you know, Asian to begin with. People were a lot smaller in the 30s. And they had real, these people, had, they'd really come of age during the Depression. So they truly hadn't had very much to eat. So I would say they're all around 85 pounds. Really tiny, tiny, and dancers, right, their whole lives. So just tiny, slim, you know, very delicate. And, you know, pretty little hairdos and their little pantsuits. But when they open their mouths, they sound like old, you know, kind of old Broadway broads, kind of <laughs> like, you know. And I can't even do it, you know. So anyway, I had said to Mai Tai, you know, what was your favorite costume? And she said, oh, you know, that's easy. It was a gown made out of 15 yards of monkey fur. I know. Here's the thing. You could not make that up, you know, <laughs> as a writer. You cannot make that up. 
And it, it actually becomes one of those difficult things to use as a writer. It's a true fact. But today we look at that and think, oh, 15 yards of monkey fur, how could you possibly do that? I mean, think about it if like Angelina Jolie showed up on the red carpet and 15 yards of monkey fur, <laughs> and people would go crazy. So, you know, it's interesting how that happens. Anyway, I have on my website um, a section on the China Dolls page. It says something like, you know, step into the world of the China Dolls. And I have clips of the performers from old films. I have interviews with them in more recent years. There are links to the, all the music, to all the clubs. There's all kinds of stuff. You could get in there and, you know, maybe never come out again. Uh, so you'll step into the world, but then you'll never be seen again. Uh, but anyway, I really encourage you to look at it. And even if you don't look at anything else, just take a look at Dorothy Toy uh, and, and her, in her performance as a young woman, because she's just amazing. All right, so everything's going along swell. Back to the story. Everything's going along well uh, at, at the, in these clubs, and then December 7th comes along. And overnight, everything changes. You know, again, for our entire country, uh, but, all, but particularly in the West, um, particularly San Francisco, for Chinese Americans, for Japanese Americans. So overnight in San Francisco, the hills are dotted with radar. They have tugboats that pull these heavy, heavy duty nets from the San Francisco side to the Sausalito side so that submarines won't come into the bay. They have uh, blimps and, sh and planes that go out past the Golden Gate every day looking for Japanese submarines. In reality, they never found one, but they did sink several whales. Uh, <laughs> This was a big defense city, and so they were building ships, trucks, tanks, ambulances. At one point during the war, San Francisco was building a ship a day, and many of the people who worked in those uh, factories were women. This is where Rosie the Riveter was invented. But a lot of the people who worked in the factories were Chinese Americans, people like my great uncles who were in Los Angeles, who, so different story, but in Los Angeles. They had been lucky enough to go to college. They graduated with degrees in engineering, but they couldn't get jobs because they were Chinese. And so they had still worked as waiters, busboys, houseboys, chauffeurs. And then when the war came, they were finally able to work in Southern California uh, in aerospace. So this was, you know, a transformative moment for them. But it's also this time, oh, and one other thing, of course, in San Francisco, it's a liberty port. Tons of men, tons, do you say tons? Thousands of men passing through, going out to the Pacific Theater, thousands of men coming back through San Francisco from the Pacific Theater. And what do young men who think they're going to die want? we'll just say wine, women, and song. Although the other night, some woman called out, sex! And I was like, oh yeah. <laughs> you know, so that's what they really want, but we'll just say wine, women, and song. And these clubs that had been going along really nicely, all of a sudden, the, the business just takes off. They've got lines around the block, packed shows three times a night. So this is also, though, a moment of incredible racism and discrimination. And so all of the negatives that had been out there for decades about the Chinese now suddenly shift to the Japanese. And one of the things I looked up was a coverage in Time and Life magazine in the weeks immediately following Pearl Harbor. And in the second issue after Pearl Harbor, both of those magazines had almost identical articles. They showed a drawing of a man with arrows pointing at different parts of his body. And I'm going to read this. Uh, this is what Life Magazine wrote. Because they were encouraging their readers to overcome their distressing ignorance on the delicate question of how to tell the difference between a Chinese and a Japanese. And so these arrows pointed out the differences. A Chinese uh, can grow to five foot five, but a Japanese man can only hit five foot two. A Chinese man can't grow hair on his chest, but you can always identify a Japanese because he can grow a mustache. A Chinese has parchment yellow skin, doesn't sound bad, but you can identify a Japanese because he has earthy yellow skin. And then all of this stuff, you know, all the truly decades of being labeled inscrutable 
Now Chinese could be identified, and again I'm going to read this, by their placid, kindly, and open expressions, <laughs> while a Japanese can always be counted on to laugh loudly at exactly the wrong time. <laughs> well, obviously all of this is nonsense, and today, of course, you know, it's, you could not write that in a mainstream <laughs> magazine. You know, you just could not do it. But this was a moment of great fear and anger and that kind of language and those kinds of articles and just the general paranoia leads eventually to the internment of the Japanese. Now, in my family, I grew up hearing stories of internment. Um, my grandfather was actually a set of, of three friends one was Tyrus Wong, the artist, the other uh, Benji Okobo, also an artist, and Benji was sent to Heart Mountain. Uh, my grandparents and my father, who was about 13, they stayed in the home of the Oki family and took care of their house and all of their possessions until the war was over. And so this family, unlike so many families, was able to keep to keep everything once the war, they had their things once the war was over, their home and everything that they had owned. After the war, my, I had un great uncles who married women who had been in various internment camps. So again, I grew up hearing these stories of internment. But I needed to find people who had been performers or who had wanted to be performers who had been sent to camps. And so I talked to uh, Trudy Long, who described she had been sent when she was 16 and described how when she got off the truck, it was into this, you know, immense uh, sand and dust storm, and she put out her hand, arm like this, and it, the sand and dust was so thick she couldn't even see her hand. And yet here was another person, 16 years old, who had incredible courage, incredible bravado really. She loved movies. She loved gossip columns. She decided one night that she was going to write to all of the gossip columnists and all of the people who wrote columns in the movie magazines. People like Walter Winchell and Dorothy I can Gil, yes, Gil Gallen. I cannot make that name come out of my mouth. Um, and she just wrote to them cold and just think about that, you know, being 16 and and out in a camp like that. And, and she wrote to them, and one of them actually answered, Lee Mortimer, who worked for the New York Daily News, and he did sponsor her to come to New York and eventually got her a job as a dancer at the China Doll nightclub, uh, even though she'd never had a dance lesson. There was another man, uh, Goro Suzuki, who was a very popular stand-up comedian in San Francisco. He was sent to Topaz, and he applied to get out and go and do his stand-up act out in the middle of the country to places like Chicago and Detroit. And he got permission. When he left, he changed his name from Goro Suzuki to Jack Sue, and Jack Sue became the first Asian American to have a, a recurring role on a television show. He was on Barney Miller. And then there was Dorothy Toy, and Dorothy Toy was the first and still the most famous of all of the Chinese Ginger Rogerses. Uh, she was 93 when I interviewed her. She's 97 today. And I won't go into the details of how she was caught, but here was, you know, she had gone through a long part of the war just as the Chinese Ginger Rogers. That, that, that identity had been established for years and years and years. No one questioned it, questioned it. But then a friend did rat her out, and when the FBI came to her, they said, you know, actually, you're famous, and so we're going to give you a choice. And so they gave her a choice. Either we'll send you to the camp where your family is, or you need to leave the state. And so she spent the rest of the war traveling through the South with her sister, who was a singer, going nightclub to nightclub. And what she said to me was, they'd never seen a Chinese, they'd never seen a Japanese, they couldn't tell the difference, we knew we'd be safe. <laughs> so. Um, this is my ninth book. I like to think that I've grown as a writer. I, I hope I have. I've been trying to follow three ideas in my writing. Two of them come from the Chinese women poets uh, of the mid-17th century. 
that I wrote about in Peony and Love. And they had uh, these very strong beliefs about how you should write and, and, and really the purpose of writing. And the first of these was, art is the heartbeat of the artist. And these words that I write, they are my heartbeat. And these books that I write, they are my heartbeat. The other was that you need to cut to the bone to write. And, you know, well, you've, I'm assuming some of you at least have read my books and you know that they can be really sad and you know that I go to some pretty dark places and even though this book has a lot of stuff with nightclubs and dancing and champagne and really great clothes uh, I've never written so much about clothes in my life but it was really important but there's some really sad things that happen and uh, some really terrible secrets that come out and it's hard for me to do that. You know, it's hard for me to go to those dark places, whether it lasts a day or a week, or sometimes it can last, you know, you're just in a dark place for a couple of months. And I try to approach it as a reader first, that what I love about books is when you open them up and you connect to those characters, whether they're real or imagined. And you think about, well, what would I have done in that situation? What would I do in that situation? Would I rise to the occasion or would I fail? Would I, would I help my family or would I betray them in some way or my friends or whatever? Uh, and I think what we're doing in that process is we're, you know, in that connection to those characters, what we're really doing by extension is connecting to the human condition, you know, really thinking about what it means to be human. So to do that as a writer, you do need to cut to the bone. And then the last uh, are a couple of lines from Angle of Repose by Wallace Stegner. And I use these lines in the epigraph from my very first book, On Gold Mountain, which is about my family. And when I used these lines, I didn't realize that these were going to be the words that would encourage me to keep writing in the way that I do, to approach my writing in the way that I do. And so here is what he wrote. Fooling around in the papers, my grandparents, especially my grandmother, left behind. I get glimpses of lives close to mine, related to mine in ways I recognize but don't completely comprehend. I'd like to live in their clothes for a while. And that's what I've been trying to do, is just live in their clothes for a while. And for me, that's been an honor and a privilege. Thank you. Okay, so we can have questions. And they really asked if you would please use the microphone. Um, uh, but if you don't use the microphone, I will repeat your question. But try to obey them so that we don't look bad on their, on their podcast. <laughs> and somebody better ask one because then I'll really look bad on their podcast. Yes. Yes, go ahead. Make a comment. Five years ago, a group of women formed a book club called the No Name Book Club because we were the last, I think, women who were not members of a book club. And so, <laughs> um, and then we read one of your books and we decided to call ourselves the Sworn Sisters mm. Book Club. And so, we've, so we refer to each other as the Sworn Sisters. Oh. And so thank you for that. Thank you so much. Now, why haven't you had me join in by Skype or something? <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yeah. I'm just sitting at home waiting for someone to say, <laughs> you know. Actually, I talk to a lot of book clubs on, on Skype. I used to do it on speakerphone, but now I do it on Skype. When I did it on speakerphone, I didn't have to get dressed or anything. But now I just have to be dressed from the waist up. Uh, I mean, I'm dressed from the waist down, but I try to, you know, I just have to look good from up here. <laughs> yes, hi, how are you? It's been a long time. I know. I'm Jeannie Jew. I want you to thank Lisa for coming here because we were the first in the United States to honor her as our Chinese-American woman 
who has done so much because we honored her at the Smithsonian. We honored her at the archives. We did everything possible to bring her out and for you to come in and look at her. She has done so much for the Chinese American women and for women all over the United States. And I want you to know that we're still in existence. We're, we're still the largest Asian women association in the United States. And we do everything to rally around her and those who want to become more knowledgeable about Asian Pacific <coughs> Americans. But let me just say about what she did for us. I'm the creator of Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. Every time you use the term Asian, Asian Pacific American, it comes out of me and it comes through this wonderful woman because we honored her during that time. She was a testimony to all women in the United States who could find their history and bring it forward and make it something unique for all of you to understand. So. Thank you so much, Jeannie. And those were such sweet words. You know that I paid her ahead of time, right? <laughs> Thank you so much. Hi, Lisa. Hi. Uh, I'm Susan Hildreth, and I'm from the Institute of Museum and Library Services here in DC. So I'm amazed at the research that you do and that you're so excited by that research. It really moves me as a librarian. and. I'm just wondering, how do you make all that, those connections? I know you're deeply engaged with the Asian American community, but how do you r find all these old ladies to talk to? I'm really <laughs> interested in that. Well, there are actually all kinds of ways that I find stuff, and, and this book was sort of interesting. One person, I, I had just, I, I, so I had spoken in Tucson, that at, not at that same Canyon Ranch thing, a whole other, they like me in Tucson, what can I say? So I'd gone to Tucson to their book festival and I'd talked and one of those people told another friend and one day I get an email saying, um, I work at a senior center and the woman who teaches jazzercise was a dancer and why don't you come out and meet her? you know, and hurry up, because she's 93. Um, <laughs> and, an and then I had, I put the photo of, of Mary up on my Facebook page, and then I had an, a message from someone saying, I'm in the Grant Avenue Follies, a kind of group of, of people who had been dancers more in the 50s, 60s, and uh, we do, the, you know, they go out still and perform at senior centers and things like that, and they said, why don't you come up and talk to us, and we'll take you to meet Dorothy. And then while I was talking to them, one of the people who came was the costume designer for the Forbidden City uh, in the later years. And he said, you know, you really should talk to Mai Tai. <laughs> she lives in Hawaii, but you know, she's gonna be in LA next week visiting her daughter. So why don't you call, give her a call? So I called her and she said, just take, you know, and heard that Broadway thing, just take me to Starbucks. <laughs> and we went to Starbucks. Um, another way, uh, was the Museum of the Chinese in the Americas in, in New York had done an exhibit on the China Doll nightclub, which was in New York, and they had done, uh, and that was like the early 1980s, they had done a series of oral histories, um, about 15 of them, not one of those people is alive today. They had never even transcribed them. <gasps> and they said, well, you know, if you want to use them, you can. And then another man who is the director, was the then director or executive director of the Angel Island Immigration Foundation. He, we had worked on so many projects together over the years, but someone else told him what I was working on and he called me up and he said, um, you know, when I graduated from college back in 1978, I thought I wanted to write plays and I, I would do a play about these nightclubs. And he also had gone out and talked to about somewhere between 15 and 20 of the performers, again, not one of them living today. He didn't write the play and he said, if you want my, you know, if you want them, I'll, I'll type them up for you and send them to you. So, you know, that right there was like, you know, 30 voices that I would not have had. But I sort of think of it like the, I call it the green Toyota effect. You know, you buy a brand new car, you think you're so unique, you got a green Toyota, and then everywhere you go, you see green Toyotas, they just like <laughs> pop up everywhere you go. And there is something I think about 
uh, you know, that kind of magical quality that you've sort of put something out into the universe mm -hmm. and the universe responds. Great. Great. Thank yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, one of the things I love about your books is the recurring theme of strong female relationships, whether they're friends or sisters. And I was wondering where that comes from from your life. I'm sure there's inspiration there. Well, I have a very strong mother, Carolyn C., who did the weekly book review here for the Washington Post for almost 30 years. Uh, and so she's not only a strong woman, but a really great writer. Um, I, my grandmother, my father's mother, was hugely influential in my life. Um, you know, I've got, I'm, I'm one of four sisters. I think of myself as an only child, but I'm actually one of four <laughs> um, sisters. So I've really been surrounded by really wonderful, strong, creative, headstrong, surviving women. You know, and I think that that aspect of survival and, and I was at a lunch yesterday in New Jersey, I don't remember where. Um, <laughs> and if I, 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 even if I think about it, I'm not gonna remember, but it's a place where they, in the cemetery right across the street from where we had our lunch, 80 uh, Revolutionary War people died, buried there. So that's all I really remember about that town. town. So you could type that in and figure out where I was. Uh, but, but we were talking at this lunch about how if you looked around the room of this particular room of women, that there wasn't a single one of them that had had an easy childhood or that had had, had an easy ride. But you know, I think that that's true everywhere, that it's very rare to find someone who has had totally an easy ride. You know, even as much privilege as you have or as much money as you have, that doesn't mean that you've had an easy ride emotionally. Uh, and you know, all kinds of things happen to us in life. And so that, to me, the th I always am, um, just inspired by the ways that people continue against terrible odds, just terrible, terrible odds sometimes, you know, really bad odds. Thank you. So I am a bookseller here. I, you caught my attention when I heard the word feather act. Um, oh. <laughs> I, uh, okay. my, my partner's a burlesque performer uh -huh. in Washington, D.C., and I just recently read a book, Behind the Burly Cue, which is all about the history of it, and I was just wondering, in your research, did you ever come across, A, people who, you know, identified, was, like, the word burlesque used at all at that time, or did that come across? Because I know you said some of them did fan dances and things like that, so. Yeah, so the que the question is about burlesque and were they using that term already? And they were using that term already, but these clubs, they really saw themselves as sort of a step above burlesque, mm -hmm. uh, even though they had that burlesque element. And the, when the women came out and danced, they were in a blue light, you know, yeah. and, and uh, they, so... But it was still in the context of, of, of a nightclub where you could take a date and, but also sometimes kids. Like people would, I mean, I can't tell you how many people have told me out on the tour, oh yeah, you know, we used to go there when I was a kid. We went every Sunday night. And I think, really? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so I think it was relatively clean, although they really didn't wear very much, uh, mm -hmm. if anything, behind those Fe those feathers and the bubble. I mean, there are old pictures of, don't. yeah, of, <laughs> yeah, of, yeah, but this is like 1938. No, so Noel Toy, you know, they're all, I'm and on my website, if you don't mind to see the naked girls, uh, I do have a couple where she's holding her balloon up, you know, and this was published all over the place. She's not wearing anything. I mean, and you just think, really? You know, that was like 1938. Come on, people. Anyway. Hi, I'm uh, Patty Chu, and I'm uh, Rip. Hi. Oh, may bend it down a little. Okay. I, um, I wanted to um, say that I really enjoyed your first book and the fantastic research you did on that book. Um, and I was interested in the fact that you've written novels and that that book is about your family. And it seems to me that you tell a lot about, about your family. You tell some very, very private and painful things. And um, I love the fact that you 
did all this research for this book, and I'm looking forward to reading it. So my question is, if you ha if you think differently when you're writing about living people, if you feel like there are things you need to put in because you have some kind of responsibility, or things that you need not to say, um, if is your writing process different? That's a really great question, and the answer is no. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't. <laughs> I try not to think differently. I try, even in fiction, you know, you're just trying to make, t I mean, I, you know, you couldn't say that these characters are based on any three people, although certainly all of those interviews that I did and all of the people, who, you know, of the interviews I was given, you will see elements or details uh, that come up. But I, to me, I, and I think that goes back to that last question, that what people went through, you have to honor what they went through. You know, you really have to honor it, and even if it's hard. Uh, with On Gold Mountain, there was only one thing that the family asked me not to include, and I, and I didn't, but only one. So they didn't mind bigamy. They didn't <laughs> mind <laughs> smuggling. They didn't mind, you know, breaking the law in 20 million ways. They didn't mind people having affairs. They didn't mind kidnapping and babies dying. I mean, the, all of that, that was, they were fine with all of that. Okay, even though this is recorded, I'm going to tell you what the one thing was. <laughs> they asked that I not include that one of the cousins got TB because it was still such uh, a stigma, you know, that that meant they'd been dirty, that they'd been overcrowded, that, you know, and, and it was still all the way in whatever the year that was, 95, it was still such a stigma that they asked that I not include that. So I didn't. And I didn't think that, given all the other stuff that I had to use, <laughs> I could live without the TB. And I could have fought them on it, but I, you know, that was one tiny, tiny detail. But I think it's important to, be, to honor the truth. It's important to honor the truth. <laughs> I really didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you all so much for coming and you're going to tell